Hello, PSI 21 Elementary Astronomy. This is Professor Ringwald. We will, in this class, start to cover chapter eight on the motions of the planets and the beginning of science. A history of science, how science got started. To be ignorant of what occurred before you or before you were born is to remain always a child, as Cicero observed. The past is never dead. It's not even past. History gets a bad reputation with the way it's taught in many K through 12 schools. For one thing, being so dishonest so often. When you start to see people in history as real people, just as scared as you are, it gets a lot more interesting. Also, science is fundamentally about the future. It's hard to predict the future. Just about the only guide that we have is from the past, because technologies come and go, but people pretty much stay the same. So, Astronomy is the oldest of the sciences, going well back into ancient times. Most of the other sciences really didn't get started until the late Renaissance, until the, really be, the beginning of the modern age in the 1600s and 1700s. But astronomy goes back millennia. The ancient Chinese had the most advanced astronomers and observatories in the world until the invention of the telescope. And remember, the reason why people around the world in ancient times wanted to know about the sky was it was how they could tell time and also the time of the year. Also, it was useful for navigation at sea. When a sailor is on a ship, they have to stay within line, uh, within sight of land. If they get out of um, uh, uh, sight of land, the only um, landmarks are there. The only way that they can tell what direction they're going if they don't have a compass is um, the sun, moon, and stars. So the ancient Chinese had the most advanced astronomers and observatories in the world until the invention of the telescope in the 1600s, well into modern times. The earliest observatories may have preceded 6000 BC during the New Stone Age, even before they had bronze or iron or refined metal of any kind when they were still making knives out of stone. They certainly had sophisticated observatories by 2300 BC. They had a complex lunar solar calendar. They kept records of their observations for many centuries. The Chinese, like we do in the West, keep time with their calendar, not just with years, so the earth going around the sun, although they didn't know that, they thought it was the sun going around the earth. In fact, it's the earth going around the sun once a year. And also with the motion of the moon through the sky, the moon going around the earth once a month, once every month. So the two cycles of months and years made for a more accurate calendar. Ancient Mayans used a third cycle, namely the motion of Venus, the planet Venus through the sky. Therefore, they had the most accurate calendar. The Chinese had a lunar solar calendar like we do. And more to the point, the Chinese kept records of their observations for many centuries. The Babylonians lived in Mesopotamia, which is now in Iraq. They began observing the sun, moon, and planets after 3500 BC and kept records of it after 1800 BC. Many of their clay tablets that they recorded their observations still exist and can be read today. The Babylonians originated the seven day week. They could see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the bright planets in the sky. Again, to the unaided eye, they just like bright stars, but they can see they move relative to other stars throughout the year. They didn't know that Earth was a planet. They didn't know about Uranus and Neptune. But uh, the, uh, the five planets they could see, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and also the sun and moon made seven. So they considered seven a lucky number and therefore they originated the seven day week. And the names we have for the day still reflect this. Sunday, the sun's day, Monday, the moon's day, 
and the others, let's see, Tuesday was in, um, in, in English, in uh, Northern uh, Germanic pantheon, that was Tyr, the war god, corresponding to Mars. Wednesday was Woden's Day, corresponding to Jupiter, the king of the gods in Greek classical mythology. Uh, Thursday was Thor's Day, corresponding to, um, to um, um, Mercury. Friday was Frigg's Day, the love goddess, uh, corresponding to Venus. And Saturday was Saturn's Day, corresponding to Kronos, or Saturn, the uh, Greek god of time. So there are connections to all of them still. It amazes me how traces of ancient cultures survive on and on. So the Babylonians originated the seven-day week. During the French Revolution, the revolutionaries tried to um, decimalize everything. They did institute the metric system of weights and measures, but they tried also to institute a 10-day calendar, a 10-day week. It never caught on. The, seven, the traditional ancient seven-day week uh, really fits human, um, what humans can do uh, very well. Uh, the Babylonians also originated dividing circles into 360 degrees, hours into 60 minutes and minutes into 60 seconds. The Babylonians had a base 60 a numbering system. They're, they knew there were 365 days a year, but they considered 360 to be uh, a very special number because it can be divided into uh, evenly into many different ways. Two times 180 is 360. Three times 120 is uh, 160. Four times uh, 90 is, is uh, 360, et cetera. Um, and therefore, that instituted 360 days a year plus five days at the end of the year for holidays. Notice that to this day, there are five days or a little more than five days between Christmas and New Year's. It's still the trace of that from ancient times. Uh, the Babylonians are widely considered in the West to be the birthplace of astronomy, although uh, the ancient Chinese were doing it at least a thousand years earlier. Yeah, but we don't have as many of the um, Chinese uh, observation, records of their observations as, as we do for the Babylonians. Uh, a lot to be said for recording your uh, important information on durable media. Um, the Babylonians are widely considered uh, everywhere to be the birthplace of mathematics. Uh, both the Old and New Testaments in the Bible uh, mention Babylon as being a very wicked place. I always thought that was somewhat uh, appropriate. The ancient Egyptians had an astronomical calendar with 365 days in a year in 2400 BC. They aligned their pyramids to the stars, originating dividing days into 24 hours. Actually, the Babylonians had originated um, um, dividing days into 12 hours. It wasn't until a thousand years later that the ancient Egyptians realized that time passes at night too, so 24 hours in a day-night cycle on the average. Uh, the Library in Alexandria in Egypt was the center of learning of the classical world, beginning at about 300 BC. The ancient Greeks began asking scientific questions about nature, such as what is the world made of, and not who made it. Scientific questions seek answers that can be understood rationally from observations of the physical natural world, not from the supernatural, intuition, or revelation. Science also follows ideas wherever they may lead. Again, the idea from chapter seven of falsification. If there's no way you can prove it right and no way you can prove it wrong, it can't be science. Uh, one's preferences or preconceived notions must not interfere with any investigation for it to be considered scientific. And it was the ancient Greeks who came up with this mindset. But the Greeks didn't invent true science. They thought that any work with their hands was beneath them, so they couldn't test their ideas by experiment. The Greeks were very much a slave society, and they looked down at anybody who uses their hand, basically used their hands. The only people in those days 
who could afford an education or the time off to get an education were wealthy people. So they had this hang up about working with their hands so they therefore could not build and test experiments. Uh, they couldn't build and run experiments to uh, test their ideas. And later they came up with excuses why it shouldn't be necessary, which we now know are quite wrong. Science is fundamentally something you do with your hands. That's why labs should be an essential part of any science course. I, uh, once we go back to in-person classes, uh, we really ought to bring back labs. Now we're doing the basically as homework assignments, but really having students out under the sky, looking through telescopes at the moon and other easy objects to find, really there's no substitute for it. Thales of Miletus is widely considered to have been the first Greek philosopher. He's old even by the standards of the ancient Greeks. He was famous for having predicted the solar eclipse of 585 BC. Keep in, keep in mind, the Iron Age in Europe began at about 1000 BC. In other words, people started uh, the ability to uh, use iron as material for making knives. Um, so this was still rather early, 585 BC. Um, Valles and Miltus predicted a uh, solar eclipse. From this, he concluded that every observable effect has a physical cause. He also argued that the, world, that the world is made of water. We giggle at this because we know it's wrong, but hey, give the guy credit. He was trying to figure out uh, an explanation to a physical phenomenon as part of a physical cause with a rational argument. Um, he thought this because he knew how mud could gather in a river. He had uh, visited uh, Babylon, which was a thriving society in his time. Babylon is between two rivers and the place is uninhabited now because the river is silted up still in ancient times. So the city was eventually abandoned and people moved on. But um, even when the city was thriving, uh, silt was built up quite a bit in both rivers. Thales uh, had seen how mud can gather a river. He'd also heard the Babylonian myth in which their god, their god Marduk, made land appear from the waters. Thales tried to find a natural way that, for this to happen without having to invoke Marduk. We now know that the world is not made of water, but Thales deserve credit for um starting a scientific inquiry the credit for asking a scientific question what is the world made of always expected a rational answer which can be observed and tested let me go back a bit ever since ancient times people had been observing astronomers had been uh, observing noticing how the bright planets mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn it hadn't occurred to anybody that the planet under your feet, the Earth is also a planet, uh, but they saw, they could see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They're all bright enough to be seen with the unaided eye. To the unaided eye, they look like uh, bright stars, but they move relative to the background stars. Look at them with a pair of binoculars or telescope, you could see their round worlds, but those wouldn't be invented until modern times. Even in ancient times, people could see the planets move relative to the background star. The word planet means wanderer in Greek. They wander relative to the background stars. The background stars are in their nice set constellations, which are still in use from ancient times, because although the stars do move through the galaxy, you really need modern scientific instruments to be able to see it at all. To the unaided eye is not, the unaided human eye is not uh, precise enough to be able to see it at all. But the planets noticeably move throughout the sky. And the ancient Chinese and the ancient Babylonians noticed this. So they kept track of it because they realized it was, it was potentially a way of keeping time, telling time, telling what time of the year it is, essentially for agriculture, also essentially for hunting, free agricultural societies. 
So Mercury and Venus shown here move through Earth's sky. This is Mercury, this one is Venus. And I went out each night from March to August and photographed this scene. Uh, next time I do it, I'm going to uh, center the thing, uh, oh, center the frame, the frame over here. This is just after sunset, notice on campus here at Fresno State. And from March through June, through July and August, each night, Venus appeared here in the sky at this time. Um, Mercury and Venus moved through the Earth's sky over several months at a characteristic yo-yo pattern. We understand that now as the planet moves around the sun, both Mercury and Venus move around the sun like Earth does, but Mercury and Venus are always closer to the sun than Earth is. So therefore, we see them just after sunset, like here, and just before sunrise, and moving in this characteristic yo-yo pattern. Back in ancient times, of course, nobody had any idea why this worked. Likewise, ever since ancient times, people had been observing Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which are all always farther from the sun than the Earth is. They also move uh, through Earth's sky from place to place throughout the months. And notice here are constellations, Cetus the whale, Pisces the fishes, Aries the ram, and so forth. And here is uh, Mars in June, July, then August, then September, and then stops and it moves backwards in October and November. And then it stops and moves forward again in January, February, and March, and so forth. This is called a retrograde loop pattern. And people had no idea why Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn did it and why Mercury and Venus did, we now know it's because Mercury and Venus move around the sun and they're always closer to the sun than Earth is. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are always farther away from the sun is, so as the Earth overtakes them in its orbit, it looks like it's going backwards. I'll show you more about this later when it was figured out by Nicholas Copernicus in the 1500s. And again, the ancient Greeks had what is, a, what is essentially recognizable today as a class prejudice. They look down on people who uh, work with their hands. Therefore, they were very good mathematicians. Uh, and their philosophy came to the beginning of science, but it really didn't get very far. It didn't find out very much about the natural world because they didn't really invent modern science. They, uh, they had this hang up of testing ideas by experiment. And here are two of them. Uh, with their beautiful temples in the background. And one of them says to the other, what I especially like about being a philosopher scientist is not having to get my hands dirty. The most famous Greek philosopher of all time, and the one considered to have the most authority, at least in medieval times, was Aristotle. Aristotle uh, wrote widely on ethics, politics, logic, and nature. You might read his works on any many other uh, college courses he may take. He reasoned correctly that Earth is round. American school children are often taught that uh, Christopher Columbus had difficulty uh, getting funding to uh, fund his uh, voyages, in which he became the first Westerner to come to the to, to the uh, New World in 1492. Even though Lee, Car Lee Erickson had done it five years, 500 years earlier. Because uh, a lot of people at the time thought the world was flat. Actually, that's flat out wrong. Well-educated Europeans in 1492 knew, knew the earth was round because they had read the works of Aristotle. And um, he reasoned correctly that earth is round. He also incorrectly reasoned that the earth could possibly move. We now know that it does move. He thought that reason alone was enough to understand nature, so he missed the importance of experimenting to test one's reasoning. He did stress empirical observations, which is watching nature to see what it does, however. He died in 324 BC. He thought that the earth was the center of the uh, universe and that, that things fall down, things fall down. There we go. 
things fall down because they're attracted to the center of the earth because the earth is the center of the universe as he would say the center of all motion we now know that's wrong but that's what he thought and that's what well-educated Europeans uh, thought well into the 1600s, uh, 1800 years, uh, more than 1800 years after he died. And Aristotle also thought that uh, the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn all moved around or orbited the earth. The moon does orbit the earth, but none of the others do. The earth orbits the sun and the other planets orbit the sun. But this is what Aristotle thought Again, because at first it seems obvious the uh, Earth is, set, is the center of the universe. It's not. It turns out it isn't. But in those days, again, they didn't have true science. So Aristotle had an Earth-centered or geocentric. Geo means Earth, like in geology or geography. Geocentric, or so Earth-centered model of the solar system. And um, get four arguments for why the Earth is round. Namely, during a lunar eclipse, this doesn't happen every month. That's the uh, monthly cycle phases. But every once every two or three years, the Earth will cast a shadow on the moon. And Aristotle noticed that every time that it does, the shadow is round. During a lunar eclipse, the Earth casts a round shadow on the moon. Aristotle also noticed that when ships sail out to sea, they disappear across the horizon, hull or bottom part first, and then superstructure later, and then mast and sails last of all. So bottom part to middle part to top part become progressively uh, what you can see of a ship. The obvious reason is because the earth is round. The earth, uh, if the earth were flat, uh, as a uh, boat or ship uh, sailed out to sea, it would fall off the edge and therefore completely disappear, all of it, and it doesn't. So ships disappear on the horizon, whole or bottom part first, because Earth is round. American school children are often taught that Christopher Columbus noticed this and gave, gave Columbus the idea that the Earth is round, and he might have, but Aristotle did it long before he ever did. Another one of Aristotle's proofs now known to be correct for why the earth is round is um, someone, a, a Greek mathematician who, lit, who uh, worked in the great uh, library of Alexandria in Egypt called Aristophanes uh, noticed that, um, well, he had heard that there was a well in a town in Egypt to south of Alexandria called Syene. And rays from the sun would only pass to the bottom of the well at noon on the first day of summer. And Aristophanes, knowing geometry, which the Greeks largely developed, realized that this implies that this would be on the tropic, pointed straight at the sun, so what we need to do to measure the circumference of the Earth would be to measure the angle that a stick shows again at noon at the same time at noon on the on the, on the first day of summer on the summer solstice. He uh, measured this angle to be seven and a fifth degrees. This is one fiftieth of a circle. So Aristophanes re reasoned that the distance from Alexandria to Syene had to be 150th of the circumference of the Earth. And the answer is surprisingly accurate. It's within his measurement of, uh, he had somebody uh, pace out how uh, far it was from, uh, from uh, Alexandria to Syene and multiply that distance times 50. And it gives you a measurement of the circumference of the Earth, the distance all the way around the Earth within 10% of the now known modern accurate value. Um, another way to say this is, as you travel farther north, circumpolar stars become higher in the sky. Um, another ancient Greek Aristophanes would use this to measure your circumference surprisingly accurately, although Aristotle knew it, uh, knew it, uh, knew it good 150 years before Aristophanes uh, did this. 
Aristotle's fourth argument, now known to be correct, why the Earth had to be round, is the reasons why we have time zones. You ever notice when you call somebody in the East Coast of the USA, they're three hours later than we are? And you call up somebody in England, they're eight hours uh, later than we are. And you call up somebody in Japan, and they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight hours later than we are, although it's the next day because the international date line is there. Actually, it's the day early uh, because, the, because of the international date line. Um, time zones are because the earth is round. Because the earth is round, the uh, different parts of the earth are facing the sun different times of, uh, of day and the earth rotates once every 24, uh, 24 hours. So the Earth is uh, divided up into 24 time zones, where all clocks within one time zone uh, set to the time set for the zone, usually in the very middle. In the USA, we have Eastern Standard Time, uh, Central Time. Chicago is on Central Time. I always thought CSD stood for Chicago Standard Time. It doesn't. It's Central Standard Time, the middle of the country. Mountain time, mountain standard time for Colorado and the Rockies. We here in Fresno were on Pacific standard time. And of course, much of the year we artificially put the uh, clocks ahead for daylight saving time, but that would be Eastern daylight time, Central daylight time, um, mountain daylight time, and uh, Western uh, daylight time. The point is, uh, Eastern time is still three hours ahead of where we are because the earth rotates, oops, the earth rotates um, that way. Therefore, the sun rises earlier in Europe than it does in the East Coast of the United States and earlier in the East Coast uh, of, of the USA than it does in North America. Well and good, you may say, but Aris, how could Aristotle possibly have known this? He didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have uh, any kind of telephone. He didn't have any kind of long distance telecommunications. How could he tell that uh, the farther east we go, the earlier the time, the earlier the sun sets, the sun rises rather. And the answer is he looked at records of solar eclipses on the same day a solar eclipse is an astonishing phenomenon. The uh, moon covers the sun for a couple minutes and night turns into day and everybody screams. And people notice that. Dogs howl. Birds come out and sing afterwards because they think it's morning. And uh, there had been several of these in the area of Greece. And he noticed that reports of um, an eclipse, for example, in um, Baghdad were always earlier in the day than in what we now call Turkey, at the time they called Asia, it still is Asia, which would happen earlier than in Greece or in Rome or in Spain. Uh, okay, Aristotle, uh, again, had four clever arguments now, all of which are now known to be correct for well, why he thought the earth was round. Aristotle also had many arguments for why he thought the earth did not move. All of these later turned out to be incorrect. For example, Aristotle thought that if earth rotated, there'd be a wind opposite the direction of rotation. He didn't realize the earth's atmosphere would be moving along with it, along with the earth. He also thought that falling objects would be deflected sideways for the same reason that as earth rotates, if you drop an object, it wouldn't fall straight down or fall sideways. But of course, he didn't know about inertia, nor did he know about relative motion. That um, when you drop a pencil, when you drop something straight down on the rotating earth, it's moving along the earth too. So it drops straight down. Uh, both of these arguments therefore are now known to be wrong because Aristotle didn't know about inertia. He never saw the connection between physics and mathematics. He never, he, he never understood that the nature, that the laws of nature are mathematical. Therefore, while we wrote about physics, he wrote about science extensively. Nearly all of what he wrote is now known to be completely incorrect. Anyway, Aristotle lived uh, 
in uh, the fourth century BC, died in 324 BC. Um, a little more than 100 years later, there was a Greek philosopher by the name of Aristarchus of Samos. He discovered that the earth moves around the sun and not the other way around as everyone had previously assumed. This result was suppressed and forgotten, however, until it was rediscovered by Copernicus over 16, 1700 years later. Aristarchus died in 210 BC, about the time the Roman Empire began to take over Greece. The Roman Empire uh, basically took over uh, most of the lands around the Mediterranean Sea. They called it Mare Nostrum, RC. And during Roman times, again, uh, the great library in Alexandria in Egypt was the center of learning. And the Greek philosopher who, was, who worked there by the name of Claudius Ptolemy refined the geocentric model, the solar system Aristotle, um, to more accurately explain and predict the motions of the planets. Again, he assumed that the Earth was in the center, so had a geocentric model of the solar system. And uh, again, with the moon and the sun orbiting or moving around the Earth, we now know that's wrong. The moon does orbit the Earth, but the Earth orbits the sun, and all the other planets orbit the sun, not the Earth. Um, and that to account for the retrograde loops, that Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were showing and the other motions that Mercury and Venus showing, he assumed that the um, planets moved on a circle that was superimposed on the circle of the orbit, the epicycle on the deferent. We giggle at this nowadays because of course we know it's flat out wrong. The earth is not the center of the solar system, but Claudius Ptolemy did um, deserve some credit because that he was able to make this work as well as it did really was very, very clever. That's one of the sad things about science. It doesn't really matter how smart you are if you start out with a false premise, namely the earth is not the center of the universe, not the center of the solar system. Um, being smart is not always prevent you from being wrong. Um, so his book on this came to be called The Almagest, which means the greatest because it summarized most of Greek astronomy when it was published in AD, in, uh, AD 140. Okay, well, the Roman Empire fell in 410 AD, the Roman Empire, which had taken over Greece and Egypt and much of the classical world was broken into, Rome was broken into by a horde of barbarians. They uh, completely trashed the place, burned everything to the ground. That was the end of the Roman empire. And then in 455, 455 AD, uh, 45 years later, the Vandal tribe came and smashed up the rest. It's where we get the name for the crime of vandalism, smashing things up just apparently for no reason or just for fun. And so Europe went into a long depressed period, the middle, the middle ages, the medieval period. But that's actually a rather Eurocentric way to look at it because actually the rest of the world was doing great. Uh, the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incas in uh, the Americas were doing great. Um, Egypt was still doing pretty well. Uh, the Eastern, what had once been the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, was doing well, centered in Istanbul. And of course, um, China was doing well, and India was doing well, and Arabia was doing well. And in fact, in, in particular, there was a lot of shipping, very lucrative shipping, of goods back and forth across the Indian Ocean. This is what Christopher Columbus wanted to get in on. This is why he tried to get to what he called India by sailing uh, west when he wanted to go east because the earth was round. He wanted to get in on that Indian shipping trade because there are lots of valuable cargoes, um, lots of valuable trade in the Indian Ocean. 
the Arabs based in uh, Baghdad in the Middle East, what is now uh, Iraq, kept Greek astronomy, classical astronomy alive after the Greek and Roman civilizations came to an end. In the eighth and ninth centuries AD, the Arabs invented algebra. Algebra, of course, is an Arabic word. Anything al and something, it's Arabic for the something. For example, alcohol. The Arabs uh, discovered alcohol. They didn't like it. Other people did, though. Um, but the Arabs also invented algebra. And the Arabs gave many stars, just about all stars bright enough so that you could see with your any and eye in the sky. The Arabs gave uh, names to, which are still used today. For example, Betelgeuse, which is Arabic for giant shoulder. And of course, it's every kid's favorite because it sounds like Betelgeuse. Um, and of course, they didn't have the printing press in those days, but they kept Ptolemy's book, uh, book from wearing out. They kept copying it. So the Almagest is Arabic for the greatest. In the following centuries, continuing observations of planetary motion increasingly showed that Ptolemy's Earth-centered model was inaccurate. Uh, more complex versions of Ptolemy's model were proposed involving epicycles on epicycles. So again, throughout medieval times, astronomers continued to observe the sky. They found Ptolemy's model to be increasingly inaccurate. The 1500s rolled around and there was a Polish cleric and doctor and uh, really an amazing person. He was so well educated. Um, mathematician too. His name was Nicholas Copernicus in Latin, which was the universal language in, in Europe at the time. His native Pol Polish, his name was Nikolai Kopernik. He realized that it's possible to understand the motion of the planets and predict the motion of the planets and use them as accurate clocks. If you abandon the assumption that the Earth is the center of the solar system, and in fact, the Earth moves and the other planets move around the sun, the only thing orbiting around the Earth still is the moon. Um, again, he applied Occam's razor, the idea that the simplest solution the solution that requires the fewest assumptions is usually the most likely. He found he could explain planetary motion if the sun was at the center of the solar system with the Earth and the other planets orbiting it. He was therefore among to realize that Earth is a planet too. He published his book, he published this in his book, De, Revolution, De Revolutionibus, which is Latin for On the Revolutions, uh, shortly before he died in 1543. A problem was that many people were very upset by the idea that Earth wasn't the center of the universe, and that his ideas contradict, uh, contradicted those of uh, the ancient philosophers Aristotle and, and Ptolemy. Legend has, has it that Copernicus was shown a final copy of his book only on his deathbed as he lay dying. But Copernicus's model, heliocentric, helios means the sun, so sun-centered, model the solar system, does provide a natural explanation for the retrograde loop. Namely, as the Earth moves its orbit around the sun, planets orbiting around the sun, not, not the planets or, and the sun orbiting Earth, but Earth orbiting the sun, as it passes by a planet always farther from the Earth than the sun, say Mars, which we've done in red, notice that as the Earth passes Mars, you see Mars stop, and then as the Earth overtakes it, appear to go backwards, and as the Earth is well past it, go forwards again. You probably have seen this event many, many, many times in your life, having grown up as a kid in the watching in the backseat of your parents' car. Say the red car is going faster than the green car, but as long as the red car is well behind the green car, from the red car, the green car looks like it's going forward. As the red car passes the green car, just as it passes, 
the red car sees the green car go backward. You've probably done this. In your parents' car at 55 miles an hour, you pass another car going 50 miles an hour. From your car, it looks like the other car is going five miles an hour in reverse. What's happening, of course, is both cars are moving forwards. You're moving five miles an hour faster than they are. And then after the red car has passed the green car, the red car sees the green car going again. It seems so obvious because we modern people have cars and see this so often, but it took a while for people in the 1500s to catch on to this. Everybody hated this. Everybody hated the idea that the earth is not the center of the universe. Everybody hated this. Uh, they were having the Protestant Reformation at the time. Not a good idea to go out in public and cast doubt on authority. And yet the very leader of the opposition, Martin Luther himself, uh, denounced Copernicus. People give a ear to an upstart, namely Copernicus. It's full wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. Well, the nature of modern science is if ideas are bound to be wrong by experiment, sometimes we do have to reverse entire sciences. And sometimes we like it. This got a little too serious. There was a monk by the name of Giordano Bruno who basically said a whole bunch of stuff we now know to be true. Namely, there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating about their suns in exactly the same way as the planets of our system, we ultra. We see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. Again, we now know this is all true. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. We still don't really know that, but we think it's likely there may be at least simple life elsewhere in the solar system. Nevertheless, people in 1600 did not like him saying that at all, and they burned him alive at the stake. And here is a place in Rome commemorating where he was burned alive at the stake. It's now a free speech center. Okay, but there still remained a need for good astronomical observations to navigate ships at sea and for timekeeping. Denmark is an island kingdom in Northern Europe. They still do a vigorous trade with shipping. And, uh, Tycho Brahe was a Danish nobleman. Um, for much of his life, he wore a gold and silver cover over his nose to hire a scar from a sword fight during his youth over who was a better mathematician. Gee whiz, nowadays when that question comes up, we sit down and solve problems. He was the greatest astronomical observer in history before the invention of the telescope. Uh, the Danish royalty paid for him to build a really fancy observatory. Not a telescope in the place because uh, telescopes hadn't been invented yet, but he built these large instruments that he used to measure the, the uh, positions of the star, uh, uh, rather of the planets in the sky, the motions of the planets through the sky. He had tens of thousands of observations every one of which was more precise than could have been done before with the few hundred that had been done before. And um, this went on for decades. So he got much better observations. And that is a tradition in modern science. If you don't understand something, get better data. Look at the details of whatever it is and notice how they work. They often give you lots of clues about how things actual work. So Tycho made thousands of observations of the positions of the planets uh, that in his time were unprecedentedly precise at the unaided eye limit of one arc minute. Uh, it was a good 10 times more precise than had previously been done. He died in 1601. His assistant, Johannes Kepler, a theorist, got his notebooks. Kepler was a German mathematician who worked for Tycho Brahe. Kepler and Tycho were among the first well-defined divisions of labor in the history of science. 
between a scientist who was primarily a theorist, Johannes Kepler, and a scientist who's primarily an experimenter, Tycho. Kepler had poor eyesight and was in poor health for much of his uh, life. So, so it was not up to the rigors of being up all night, every night observing, whereas Tycho was very good at this. Tycho was not a very good mathematician and he needed help with mathematics, which was what he hired Kepler to do. Um, Kepler got Tycho's notebooks uh, after Tycho died and he examined them, took 20 years of crunching numbers. Again, no calculators or computers in these days, all by hand. And after a great deal of labor, Kepler came to the conclusion that these observations of Tycho were showing that the planets were doing three things that people hadn't noticed before. Therefore called Kepler's laws of planetary motion, three laws. Kepler's first law was that planet orbits are ellipses, not circles in which the sun is at one focus. You put down two thumbtacks and put a pencil in and draw the trace and that gives you an ellipse. A circle is of course, the set of points at the same distance from one point, the center. This is from two. The planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits, not circles, totally unexpected. And a direct contradiction of the ancient Greeks who argued that circles were perfect. Therefore, the uh, planets had to move around the sun in circles. Kepler's second law was that a line joining the planet of the sun will sweep out equal areas in equal times. When a planet is close to the sun, it'll take only 15 days to get from there to there and, and sweep out an, an area that is equal to the area of the um, triangle uh, when um, the planet is far from the sun. And notice when the planet is close to the sun, it goes fast, it goes from there to there in 15 days. When the planet is far from the sun, it goes slow from there to there in 15 days. Again, the universe follows orderly mathematical laws. And this was one of the first demonstrations of it. Um, the early scientists looked into the universe and found mathematics and geometry everywhere they saw, much to their surprise. Therefore, contradicting Aristotle's idea, now known to be wrong, that mathematics is on one plane and physics reality is different. No, they're, they're intimately related to each other. Kepler's third law was that the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun, its orbital period, depends only on its average distance from the sun, such that the average distance from the sun cubed divided by the uh, orbital period squared is equal to one. It takes the earth uh, 365 days or one year to go around the sun. Earth is one astronomical unit or 150 million kilometers from the sun. It takes Mercury 88 days to go around the sun, it takes Venus 243 days to go around the sun, it takes Mars 1.52 uh, years to go around the sun, Jupiter 12 years, Saturn 29 years, Uranus 84 years, Neptune 162 years. And the relation between how long it takes them to go around is clearly linked mathematically with the average distance from the sun. So the average distance from the sun cubed um, is proportional to the orbital period squared. Anytime a scientist discovers something in nature uh, that, in other words, if one plots the orbital period squared against the uh, average distance from the sun for each planet cubed for all the planets, all the point, points will fall along a straight line which clearly shows a connection, which I've shown here. Anytime a scientist discovers a simple mathematical relation in nature like this, nature is trying to tell that scientist something because the universe follows orderly mathematical laws. Still, Kepler's laws were, strip, were strictly empirical. Empirical means he could show that they worked, but he didn't understand why they worked. So Kepler did not know why the laws worked, just so they did work. It would be up to Isaac Newton a generation later to explain why. 
Kepler was a contemporary of uh, Galileo, also Shakespeare. Um, Kepler and Galileo wrote to each other. Galileo died in 1642, the year that Isaac Newton was born. So they're exactly um, uh, one generation apart. And it was Newton who uses laws of motion and gravity to figure out why this is. Let me stop there for today.